Hello, everyone, and welcome to another edition of The Money Pros. I'm Oliver Tutt, Certified Financial Planner Practitioner, and I'll be your host for the next half hour. So we talk about all the issues related to your money, how to make it, how to keep it, and hopefully how to help it grow. Let me give you a rundown of what's in store for today's show. First up, we're going to be talking about a survey that just came out from TIA CREF about uh, retirement dates and how set in stone they actually are. and what are the, What's the likelihood that you might change yours as you approach retirement? Uh, so that's going to be first up. Uh, we're going to be joined uh, as our special guest by our mortgage pro, none other than Steve Tetzner with Homestar Mortgage. We're going to be talking about a topic that was actually a special request, uh, someone to explain uh, home equity loans and lines of credit. So who better than our mortgage pro to do that? So we're going to be talking about that today. Um, in the third segment, we're going to be talking about a question that I get a lot, and it's a little bit conceptual, but it comes up a lot with financial planning, and it really cuts to the heart of personal finance, and that's the question of, can you afford it? Uh, if there's something you want to buy, that it's uh, a big purchase uh, outside of your usual you know, groceries, electrical bill, things like that, uh, and you want to decide, is that something you can really afford to do? How do you make that decision? And this is a question that comes up a lot, and people make this decision in a lot of different ways, and sometimes it's to their detriment. So I'm going to give you some thoughts on that. And finally, uh, for those of you that are Seinfeld fans, you're going to be uh, familiar with the Soup Nazi. Well, the Soup Nazi got in some tax trouble recently, and I wanted to share that uh, news uh, with our Money Pros viewers, uh, because that's a topic that comes up a lot on this show as well. Uh, so we're going to be talking about all those things. Well, let's jump into it. The first thing up is a new survey out from TIA CREF. Now, uh, TIA CREF, uh, many of you are probably familiar with. They are uh, the sponsors, managers of the state's uh, retirement plan, as well as many uh, state retirement plans throughout the country. Uh, if you are a uh, employee of a university or many other private schools, uh, you were, some of your pension may be offered by uh, TIA CREF. So very large uh, retirement mutual fund uh, insurance annuity company. Uh, so they put out a lot of research on things related to retirement. And they recently did a survey, and I thought some of the results were interesting, and I wanted to sh share them uh, with our viewers. But first, a little bit of uh, the detail of the survey. So they surveyed 1,000 people between the ages of 55 and 68, and they also had to indicate, these people, uh, that they were planning to retire within the next five years. Uh, so what they wanted to look at, the primary purpose for the study was uh, to compare anticipated retirement dates with dates uh, with the date that they that that same person anticipated 10 years previously. Uh, and interestingly enough, 61% indicated that they've changed the date as they've gotten closer. So let me put up the details of the results of the survey. And we'll just talk quickly about that. So. Uh, according to the survey, 37% indicated that they're on target. So in other words, according to the survey, when they were asked, they were planning on the same date that they had planned on 10 years prior. So they were still on target. So those folks hadn't changed. But 24% of people plan to retire earlier. Now this is kind of interesting because I think a lot of people would assume that if the date was going to change, uh, that people would be putting off retirement. The assumption being maybe they didn't have enough money, they didn't feel secure enough quite yet. The reality is a lot of people when they change the date, as uh, they work longer and longer, they realize they simply can't take it anymore and they end up moving their retirement dates forward. And this is something that I've seen a number of times in my practice. But of course, uh, the final piece, 37% of those people surveyed indicated that they plan to retire later than the date they had in mind uh, 10 years prior. So for many people, they do in fact delay the date uh, with which um, they plan on retiring. And I've actually seen this where the date is pushed off uh, multiple occasions. So people go into it thinking they're going to retire maybe early at 62. Then when 62 approaches, they say, well, I'm going to push it off to 65, 67. I had one client go all the way to 70 before she decided uh, that it was actually time to, to pull the plug. So it's not unusual, and that can happen for a variety of different reasons. That's borne out by the TIA CREF survey. So some other results from the survey that I thought you might find interesting. Priorities in retirement, 96% of people indicated that they wanted to have flexibility to do whatever they wanted. I think that that probably goes without uh, saying. 93% of people indicated they 
They wanted to spend time with friends and family. And 80% indicated that they wanted to spend more time uh, traveling. In my experience, this travel one is one that people throw up a lot. Yeah, I want to do more traveling. Unfortunately, what I see too often is when people finally retire, they're distracted by a lot of other things. I don't see the travel as much as people anticipate they're going to travel. In terms of feeling prepared for retirement, kind of mixed news here, 43% of people uh, reported feeling uh, extremely or very prepared for retirement. Now keep in mind, these are people that are planning to retire within the next five years. So 43% uh, feel extremely prepared, 46% feel somewhat prepared, 55% are prepared, are, uh, only 55% feel prepared to manage retirement income. And interestingly for me in the past probably uh, six weeks, that's been the most common phone call I've gotten from uh, prospective clients is questions about uh, how to manage retirement income. So that's not an unusual issue to have. So some interesting results from the TIA CREF survey. Wanted to share them with you. Hope you found them interesting too. All right, up next is Steve Tetzner from Homestar Mortgage. We're going to be talking home equity loans. Stay with us. Welcome back to the Money Pros. I'm joined now by our mortgage pro, Steve Tetz from Homestar Mortgage. Steve, thanks for being with us. Pleasure to be here. So we talk about what uh, uh, topics we're going to cover on the show, and I actually emailed you and I said, I have a client who wants uh, somebody to explain home equity loans to her because uh, this was a process she went through and mm -hmm. she found some of it convoluted. And you were kind enough to say, all right, let's do yeah, that. Absolutely. So let's talk about it. Uh, because I'm sure if she has a question, uh, there are a lot of other people that have questions about it too. So I guess the first question, let's just be very entry level about it and say, I mean, what are we talking about when we say a home equity loan? Isn't any mortgage you take out on your house a home equity loan, in essence? Uh, technically not. I mean, a first mortgage is just that. It's a first mortgage. It's a different money supply than where home equity money comes from. Okay. Home equity money is money that the banks are actually lending their own money, where a mortgage is typically a secondary market product, you know, lending from, you know, Fannie Mae, Freddie Mac, et cetera. Um, home equity typically is a second lien position. It can be a first lien position for people who maybe paid off their first mortgage mm -hmm. already and then just go out and get some type of equity product, but typically it's a second lien position behind a first mortgage. So to set this up, client bought their house, they used a first mortgage, typically we're saying, mm -hmm. uh, to buy the house, so that's their first mortgage, that's not what we're talking about here. Correct. Now we're talking about they go out and take out another loan to borrow additional equity out. And you're saying this money is actually being borrowed from the bank, unlike the traditional first mortgages we talk a lot about on this show. Correct. Okay. Correct. So there's a lot of different types of these loans, and this mm -hmm. is where we want to spend some of our time. Can you give us a breakdown of the universe of home equity loan products and how they're different from one another? Sure. So uh, the home equity pr uh, environment includes both fixed rate product and adjustable rate. So there are loans and there are lines. So a loan is typically just like a first mortgage. It might be a 5, 10, 15, 20, 25 year amortization, fixed rate type of product, um, and something where the borrower, more of a longer term defined lending. So they, they're doing a specific project or they're buying a boat or they're buying a car and it's cheaper to do it with a home equity product. A lot of these products now come back where certain banks and credit unions are actually letting people borrow back out to 100% of the market value of their homes. Um, a home equity line is typically a variable rate. That's what you see advertised most of the time. It's a line of credit. So it, I hate to use the word credit card, but it's like a credit card on your house. Um, obviously a much lower rate and the interest can typically be tax deductible on home equity products. Mm -hmm. The home equity line is a line of credit. So you can draw money out and use it and then pay it back and then draw the money out. Typically the draw period will last about 10 years on a home equity line of credit. After that 10 year period is expired, you would either refinance it to a different product or you would begin to go into an amortization, usually a 20 year repayment amortization on whatever the, the balance is at that time. It's typically tied to prime rate, which is the rate that you know the Federal Reserve basically is, is influencing directly. So you know when you hear, hey, the Fed raised rates, that's going to hit your that's going to hit your home equity line, line immediately. Mm -hmm. Yep, effective that day. The 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 lower the loan to value, the better the rate you're going to get on any product. So if you're borrowing out to 80 percent, you're going to get a better rate than somebody who's looking to borrow to 90 percent or 100 percent of the value of their home. 
Home equity lines typically are for short-term lending, so you're going to take the money out, you're going to pay it back in a short period of time, but you want to have the flexibility. And I'll All right, so but before we get into the, and that's the next thing I want to talk okay, about, sure. but just to make sure that everybody understands, home equity loan as distinguished from a home equity line, it seems, seems to me that the major differentiating factors are uh, the fixed versus a variable rate. Typically, Fixed yes. rate, so the, on the home equity uh, loan, the rate that you're quoted is the rate for the life of the loan, Correct. and that there's going to be some fixed payment schedule, like you said, 5, 10, 15 year period that you're going to pay back that loan. A lot like a first mortgage or exactly. a car loan or something like that mm -hmm. that somebody might be familiar with. Home equity line, the rate's going to vary based on the prime rate, plus I imagine some margin. margin. Yep. And there's not a set payment schedule, at least initially. It's, it would usually be an interest only payment. Uh, on a monthly basis until you get out of your 10-year draw period. Okay, so we've set the stage to two dis uh, very different uh, distinct products. Mm -hmm. How are people using the different products? What are situations, techniques, methods, you know, what does one work best in where, uh, and another one not work well in, et cetera? Well, getting back to that, typically uh, if you go and you do a home equity loan, it's something where you've got a defined project. So I need $50,000 or $30,000 and you want to pay it back in a set period of time. If you know that it's going to take you three, five, seven, ten years to pay it back, I always recommend to my clients to do the fixed rate loan product. Mm -hmm. If it's a situation where it's short term lending, then you use the line and then that gives you the flexibility of paying a minimal payment, but you know, I have a lot of clients that receive annual bonuses. So they may do a project on their house and then when they receive their bonus, they'll pay their line off. Um, and having a home equity line of credit available on your home, even if you don't have a project to do, but just to have that reserve available to you doesn't in any way hurt you. Um, there might be an annual fee of 50 or $75 to maintain it, but it's a nice thing to have if you have equity in your property, just to have that line of credit available in the event of a large purchase or an emergency. So line of credit, we, uh, you know, and I talk to clients about this, I have one as well, can be used for a lot of different things, but an emergency fund is kind of one of them. It's, it's a reservoir of credit, and credit is a valuable thing, obviously, mm -hmm. uh, that you can tap on a relatively economic basis, certainly compared to most you know, loans that consumers can get out there, it's probably going to be one of the least uh, expensive to get uh, a large amount of money. But you're saying on the home equity loan side uh, for set projects sort of over a, a particular period of time, so I guess typical examples would be an addition, right? Home improvement. Yeah. Maybe buying a car, we could you know, discuss the, the merits of, of that, but like a one-time purchase kind of a thing, mm -hmm. boat, something like that. Um, those are the typical things where you're going to see that. Um, how much, and you, you alluded to this a little bit earlier, but how uh, is it determined how much somebody can borrow? Uh, you talked about 80% of value, 90% of value, in some cases even 100% of value. Mm -hmm. But what's that whole process like? Somebody wants X bank will only give them why. How is that decision being made? Well, the, made? the bank's going to do an appraisal on the property, determine okay. current market value. Um, if the product that they're lending, that they're applying for, allows them to go to 90% of the value, to keep it simple, house is worth 100000 they have a first mortgage of 70000 so they can borrow a total combined of the first and the second, the equity product, up to 90000 or 90%, so they could get a $20,000 loan or line. So it, it depends on the parameters of the, the loan or line that they're applying for. And obviously, the closer you get, over 80 up to the 100%, the higher the interest rate, the higher the risk. Um, what we're seeing now, too, is home equities are being used for bridge loans. So people who are looking to buy a home before they sell their current home, mm -hmm. they might put a home equity line of credit on the house that they're buying or even the house that they're selling. Uh, it helps them bridge that equity grap, uh, gap until they actually sell their current home. And the 801010 is back. Uh, the old product where you buy a home, you put 10% down, you take a first mortgage for 80%, a second mortgage for 10% to avoid the private mortgage insurance. Okay. Um, also very popular in the jumbo market. Um, you know, for example, we offer a product, you can buy a house for a million dollars and only put 10% down. You do an 80% first mortgage, a 10% equity mortgage, uh, or equity line, depending on what the, pro the, the consumer wants, and they're using it to purchase homes with lower de down payments and putting the 20%. So there are various uh, financing strategies that these different products can be 
uh, used with. In fact, the, the one you just talked about was one that had been suggested uh, to me with the possibility of buying another house. I mean, if you have to put down a deposit of 5% on a million dollar house, you're talking about a $50,000 check. Mm -hmm. Not everybody can tap $50,000 in cash. You might have to liquidate securities. It might not be an opportune time to do that. But you can write a $50,000 check on your line of credit as a deposit on a new house, potentially. So you see that happening quite often. Yeah, not just the deposit, but the down payment. Because typical in this market, because the, the purchase market is so aggressive, uh, if you want to buy in that price range, it's, it's difficult to make it contingent on selling your current home. So if you have a half million dollar home with a $200,000 mortgage, you've got $300,000 in equity you want to roll into that new home. Mm -hmm. Well, if you had an equity line for $200,000, you could take that whole 200000 and roll it into the purchase, put your 20% down on your million-dollar home without tapping into maybe retirement or investment money. So it, having a home equity line is a is really smart thing to do. So, and, and, and wasn't planning on asking this question, but you would probably advise that somebody have it even if they didn't have any immediate plans for it. Correct. If you don't draw any money on it, you it's not going to cause anything. So let's talk about costs. Does the application process differ from a traditional first mortgage application process? And what are some of the costs, closing costs, uh, uh, you know, prepayment penalty, you know, anything? What are the things that consumers should be aware of in terms of taking the loan out? Good question. Most of the time, if you're, you're doing an after purchase, uh, home equity product where you already own the home and you're tapping the equity. Typically the home equity products are done with no closing costs, but they will have an early termination fee typically. So if, for example, if you terminate the line and sell the house within two years or three years of taking the line, the bank might charge you a $350 or $500 penalty for terminating the line because it costs them money to put that line in place mm -hmm. because they're paying the appraisal fee, they're paying the, you know, title rundown fee, et cetera. Mm -hmm. So they need to recuperate those costs. Okay. Uh, last question I definitely want to ask, and we're pretty much out of time, but uh, during the housing crisis, we saw lenders rescind lines of credit. Mm -hmm. uh, the borrowers were not in trouble, but the lenders just didn't want the risk out there. Do you see that happening again, potentially? Do lenders have that right still? Is that something to be aware of? Absolutely. I mean, if you signed a, a loan, a line agreement where the line is only to 80% of the value, and then your home value drops by 20, 30, 40%, that equity position may no longer be there. So you're violating the terms of the line. They, they have the right to terminate. They're not, they were terminating them because, in many cases, the line amount, when the, when the property values dropped, would now exceed 80, 90, maybe even the, the full value of the home. And the banks have to protect themselves. They can't be on the hook for a, uh, a loan where the collateral is no longer worth That's being correct. loaned out. Yep. All right, Steve, great information. I Thanks. hope that answers some of my clients' <laughs> questions. I know it answered many of mine. Yep. All right, uh, up next, we're going to be talking about the question of can you afford it? Have you ever asked yourself that question when you thought about a big purchase? Stay tuned. We'll share some thoughts on how you can figure that out. We'll be right back. Welcome back to The Money Pros. So I want to talk a little bit about something that comes up from time to time, and that's the question that uh, people will ask themselves. Sometimes they'll ask me if they're a client, a question about can I afford it? Now, I'm not talking about can I afford to go out to dinner tonight uh, or can I afford a cup of coffee at Starbucks. I'm talking about sort of major purchases where you look at something and you say, you know, I'd really like to do this, whether it's a vacation, a new car, a boat, uh, you know, uh, stereo system, whatever it is, an unusually uh, large purchase, let's say maybe equal to at least uh, one month's take home pay, if not substantially more. And you're asking yourself, can I afford to do this? Uh, and many people will not ask themselves this question at all. We call that sort of the, the stick your head in the sand, the ostrich approach, like I'm not going to figure it out, I'm just going to do it. And obviously that's one approach, it's not one that I would advocate. But for those of you that actually take the step of asking yourself, is this something I can afford, let me give you some other questions to reflect on to help you maybe figure that out. Because let's keep in mind that personal finance is all about uh, current consumption versus future consumption. Uh, it's not all about saving for the future. You've got to do some things now and you've got to be able to do some things later and you've got to be able to balance those two things uh, so that you have a happy financial life. So you've got to be able to evaluate this question effectively. So let me take you through some of the questions you can ask yourself and you can see how this personal conversation goes as you decide can I afford to do this. And the first one is are you a net saver? Look, we talk about this on the show all the time. The key metric to whether your financial situation is healthy or not, the only thing that matters is, are you a net saver? Do you spend less than you make? Now, 
you can evaluate whether you're a net saver on a variety of different time periods. You can say, am I a net saver this day, this week, this month, or this year? Now, days, weeks, and months don't make a lot uh, of difference. Maybe when you get to the month, it's important to look if you're a net saver or a net spender. Uh, but looking at it on a yearly basis becomes a very efficient metric to decide, have I saved anything this year? If you're a net saver, that bodes well for the idea that you can afford to do something. It'll eat into your savings, but it won't further put you underwater when it comes with your ability to become a net saver. If you're not a net saver, you've really got to evaluate trying to get there first. Next, do you have revolving credit uh, or revolving debt? If you carry balances on credit cards from month to month, I don't mean you use credit cards as a convenience and then you pay them off at the end of the month. I mean, do you carry balances from month to month? That is an immediate indication that you're a net spender. Most things you probably can't afford, you need to get rid of revolving debt before you make any big purchases or you need to weigh that decision very, very carefully. Next. Are your long-term goals on track? Have you done any long-term financial planning? Are you putting money away for college, uh, for retirement, uh, for whatever your long-term financial goals are? If those goals are on track, then you have to evaluate, is this expenditure going to upset those goals? And if it's not going to, then that obviously would indicate that this is something you can afford to do. If it is going to affect those goals, then you have to balance the impact of your, on your long-term goals with the joy or pleasure you're going to get out of the current expenditure that you're looking to make. But at least you have something to weigh, the future goal versus the present uh, goal. And then finally, how long is it going to take to pay this back? So if you're going to make an expenditure that, let's say, normally you're a net saver over the course of a year, but this particular expenditure is going to throw you into the category of being a net spender, the question is, under your normal savings pace, how long will it take you to essentially pay yourself back? So if you're saving on a net basis $500 a month, that's $6,000 a year, and this expenditure is $12,000, that's two years of savings to get back to even. So evaluate that equation and decide, is that the kind of impact you want to have on your finances? Look, we all realize you're going to spend some money. There's going to be things that come up you're going to want to do, moments you're going to want to take advantage of. But these are just some things to think about and rationalize as you consider whether you can really afford to do this thing that you badly want to do. All right, up next we're going to be talking about the soup Nazi uh, for those Seinfeld fans that are out there and some tax trouble we got in. Uh, stay with us. We'll be right back. Uh, welcome back to The Money Pros. Uh, those of you watching that are Seinfeld fans will remember the soup Nazi in the episode about no soup for you. Well, it actually turns out uh, Soup Man is a, uh, turned into a pretty big uh, chain of soup restaurants uh, based in Staten Island. And the CFO of uh, Soup Man, so not the, not the character that you see on the TV show, but the CFO, the guy uh, responsible for the finances, got in a bit of, of tax trouble with the IRS, and it's significant tax trouble. Uh, and it's uh, related to not paying uh, withholding taxes on Social Security, Medicare, and income uh, for income paid to employees of Soup Man Incorporated. Uh, so what was happening is he was basically paying employees under the table, but this wasn't just a small uh, sort of side transaction. This amounted to a couple of million bucks that amounted to over $500,000 in taxes that were avoided by Suitman Incorporated. So this gentleman is facing five years in pr prison. So let this be a warning to any of you that uh, think about the idea of not paying your entire uh, IRS bill, it doesn't just mean taxes and penalties, it can in fact uh, also mean uh, criminal charges, which is not something you want to face. So not only no soup for you, uh, but five years of no freedom for you is not a great deal. Hey, thanks for watching The Money Pros. We look forward to seeing you again next time right here on The Money Pros. Take care, folks. Have a great weekend.